This is Peter Helland with Dr. E. Michael Jones, and we're going to take off from the, the show last time. Uh, that the show we had last time, I've never seen so many comments, and uh, it's kind of like a different world because for since I don't know 1986, I used to have up to three hours a week here locally. I'd see people on the street, and they'd you know they'd all say I saw your show, but I I would never get a comment, never get a response, you know, and all of a sudden. You can get people just commenting. Yeah, all over the world. So as I said the last time, the room has gotten bigger. Okay, the room in which we all speak has gotten bigger. We've got a language that can, English, that can reach the entire world. And now we're starting to talk to the entire world. But guess what? The first thing that happens when you open your mouth is you create misunderstanding. Right? Well, <laughs> and this show was no exception to that rule. Right, and the misunderstanding was, and, and this was not planned because we were going to talk about Apocalypse Deferred, the article that you have in your April edition. Yeah. And then you came across the quote by Cardinal Burke where he said that the Christians and the Muslims do not worship the same God. Right. And that really triggered you. Yeah. It's like, whoa. Yeah. And you didn't, because, you didn't because, like... Because it's wrong. It's wrong. It's obviously wrong. And this is the comment that you make in a little room where you're talking to a little group of people. But it's a comment that will not fly, even if you expand the room just to be the big room of the Catholic Church, the entire Catholic Church, because this is not the teaching of the Catholic Church. And you pointed that out in the comment box on YouTube. Right, right, because I think I was talking to a friend, and he said, well, what, what does it say in the, in the catechism? Right. And if, and if you're Catholic, the catechism is... Is a, is, a, is a major reference point. Sure, sure. But you don't need the catechism because we have reason. And this is a statement that is apod apodictic, which means it's true by the very nature of the premises in the statement. So as soon as you're talking about monotheism, that means there is one God. Well, if everyone is worshiping one God, then everyone is worshiping the same God. All monotheists worship the same God. So Muslims worship the same God, Jews worship the same God, and Christians worship the same God. Does that mean they always get along with each other? No, it does not mean that. Does that mean that there has been strife throughout history between these two groups? Yes, of course it means that. So what is the difference? The difference is the understanding of God. It's not that God is different or that there are two gods. Is Cardinal Burke a polytheist? Is he claiming that there are two gods out there? Uh, if so, he's contradicting uh, the Catholic faith and I think reason as well. Well, the history of the, uh, the Muslim church, Islam, was that it, it kind of was a heresy off of a, a branch of Christianity. So if you have 200 churches in a town and you're trying to figure out, you move into a town, you're trying to figure out, well, which church should I go to? Well, they, all, they could be all Christian churches, but everyone is saying, well, we worship the God a little bit differently than that church. Right. And the, uh, the, middle, the Middle East, what we call the Middle East now, Northern Africa, uh, places like that, were uh, infested with heresy in, the, in the, late, the period of late antiquity. And you had another complicating factor in that philosophy had fallen into a state of complete decadence by the time of late antiquity. What started off with Plato, oh, let's start with Anaxagoras, the man who came up with the idea of Logos, uh, that there's an order to the universe, <clears throat> that human speech is a manifestation of that order and can uh, allow the human mind access to that order. This idea was carried forward by Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle in one of the greatest bursts of intellectual activity in the history of the human race. But unfortunately, after Aristotle, Greek philosophy descended into magic. Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism, which is magic. So by the time of um, Julian the Apostate, who was going to return the Roman Empire back to its pagan roots, uh, by the time he became Roman Emperor, uh, 
uh, it was the Eleusinian mysteries, it was uh, Neoplatonism, it was all this uh, mumbo jumbo that was basically will to power. In other words, what's the formula out there, the magic formula that will allow me to get what I want? And a modern manifestation of this is, of course, Harry Potter, which is education is basically magic formulas that get you what you want. It's, of course, a widespread view among education. Well, what about, okay, when I had that case go to the Supreme Court, it went to the federal court here at the same time, you know, for having a Bible in the classroom. So in Missouri, at the same time that the federal court here in South Bend decided, the Missouri court decided that this teacher, this teacher in Missouri was fired for practicing magic by the school board on a magic rock. That, that, was, that decision was overturned by the federal court. She was allowed to practice magic. Right. I was not allowed to bring the Bible in the classroom. Right. Well, we're, we're in a, a, say, a stage similar to the late Roman Empire. What that proves is it's simply will to power, and anything that contradicts will to power significantly, like the, the Catholic faith, like the church, will be marginalized. And that's precisely what has happened, especially since World War II. The whole notion of separation of church and state is a completely new phenomenon that was created after World War II to basically deal with the rise of Catholic political power didn't exist before that. As our, you know, uh, well, you a famous incident here in South Bend, your a case comes up before the, the, uh, the, the Socrates, before the wise men at the South Bend Tribune, and Bill Moore writes a letter attacking you saying, that's why the separation of church and state is in the Constitution. Well, Bill, it ain't in the Constitution. It's not in any document other than a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to some ministers at the time. It didn't become a determining factor until after World War II when the American empire began its last consolidation phase. Right, with this, the Emer Emerson case and then the Supreme Court right, justices. Right, right. It was all about bus, bus, kid, Catholic kids riding buses in New York State and stuff like that. So it's a complete fiction. But we have internalized this fiction, and we have uh, internalized the commands of our oppressors. And there is some basis in reality to what we're talking about, because there is a difference between ratio and fides. Faith and reason. Faith and reason. Which was um, the title of an encyclical that Pope John Paul II... 1998. And then uh, uh, he wrote it to the bishops, which some people for, yeah. sometimes yeah. forget. And, and it's, uh, it's a brilliant piece of writing, uh, and it basically uh, substantiates both principles here. They are both valid principles. There is an autonomous human reason. It was not a Christian invention. Anaxagoras was not a Christian. He lived 300 some years before the Christ arrival on earth. This period of time was the birth of the understanding of reason, and it, 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 because it, 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 this, the, the fact that it was born in Greece before Christ shows that philosophy has an autonomy that should not be violated. Uh, you, you, the three wise men, I don't even know if it says three, but the wise men, how did they get there? Didn't they have to use reason? And then right. there was so, faith? So, so even, let's, let's put it this way, even the Christian scriptures, which were given by God, recognize the autonomous role of reason. The best example is St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, where he says, the pagans are without excuse because you can know the existence of God simply by looking at his, at his creation. The three magi or wise men are an example of this. Who, what, what were they? They were Persians. They were living off in the desert. What were they doing? They were philosophers or at the same time, when you were a philosopher, then you were also an astronomer. And so they were studying the skies. And they saw that there was a pattern to that, up what was up there, and that it was bigger than their desires and bigger than their little world. And they decided that they, they had to understand that pattern if they wanted to understand their place in the universe. At this point, a star, a new star appears. And at this point, they have to, they think this is important and we're going to follow it. So right, you have, so they, right. So wisdom, just pure. First of all, wisdom, you have logos, you know, the recognition that there's a logos in the sky. And secondly, you have the courage to act on what you know. This is the essence of prudence. This is what prudence is. Understanding the truth and the courage to act on the truth. And that's what they do. And they follow, walk through the desert. And finally, what do they discover? They discover the logos incarnate. 
Now, this is something completely new, completely new. The idea that God could take on human form is maybe maybe hinted at in Greek mythology, hinted at in all these stories about heroes and gods who do this, that, and the other thing, but now it actually happened. So what you have is something that was before, something like metaphysics, uh, the stars, the movement of the stars, and now there's a human being that embodies the whole thing. Completely new. Now, history is completely different. Now, time is completely different. Now, everything changes. And the main change now is that the Logos, Logos is God. The Logos that created everything else. And we've been studying his being simply by his works is now going to reveal something of himself to us that we could never have uh, figured out on our own. But we could get like the wise men, if you're using your wisdom, you can, you and so, can, so you can the, get there. You right. can get within the area. That's right. This is, so we have here the, the, the right order of things. There is an order established. Philosophy has its own autonomy. There is a logos to the universe that the human mind can find. We can know for certain that God exists that he created this world simply by reason alone. And then we're, uh, human history progressed to a certain point where now there's another step forward and God has become incarnate and now he's going to reveal something of his inner self to us that we could not have figured out by reason alone. And because we can't figure it out by reason alone, we have to accept it by faith. But faith does not contradict reason. No, because reason, reason looked at Christ and reasoned by the facts right. that he was God, because this he, is something only new. God can stop the wind. Th that's right. So this is, this is something new. Now it's time. It has a significance that it never had with the Greeks, because the Greeks were great with things like geometry. There's no time in geometry. It's, it's like a, an eternal... Now time is a significant movement, and now we have some type of deeper understanding of the nature of the universe that came to us in history. And it's up to us to accept it or reject it. We can't reason to it. We can't just say, okay, look, I can prove the existence of God, but I can't prove this, so we have to accept it by faith. So the question is, are we going to move forward or not? Well, the Jews give us a good example of people who do not want to move forward. And so they rejected Christ, they killed him, and they became enemies of the entire human race and revolutionaries because they rejected Logos. And if you reject Logos, you're rejecting the order that God created for the universe. And you, became, you become permanent revolutionaries, which is what they are today, from Simon Bar Kochba up to Leon Trotsky, up to Rabbi David Saperstein promoting gay marriage. The Jew is, by essence, because of his rejection, a revolutionary who's always going to be causing problems. But that raises the issue of uh, part of the definition of logos is the, the law of non-contradiction. And everywhere you go in America, from its beginning, I mean, the British uh, Wesley successor said, if you guys are going to do what you're doing, you might as well throw away the scriptures. In other words, he saw right there was a huge contradiction. There was contradictions throughout our history that we've internalized. Right. The one we're seeing with the Jews is we want to say they're God's chosen people and just, oh, and just be our main ally. But then you have the scriptures that say, hold it here. They kill Christ. They're continually our main enemy. You know, even Calvin, even Luther, I mean, all the theologians. Right. So that's violating the law of non-contradiction when you, you want to hold them right. as your... Yeah, right. We've, we've talked about this before. Let's, this isn't about the Jews today. Let's, we're talking about this movement of Logos here, okay? Now, it didn't... It, it, for a thousand years, Augustine ruled Europe, the, the concepts that he... Because Augustine combined... The, the Hebrew scriptures and Greek philosophy in a powerful combination that basically created Europe. And so for a thousand years, more, yeah, a thousand years, fall of Rome up to the end of the 15th century, and then suddenly our friend Martin Luther comes along. Who was an Augustinian. Who was an Augustinian, very, that one of the spiritual progeny of St. Augustine, uh, who basically rejects reason. Reason's a whore. And why did he reject that? Well, because for lots of reasons, but mostly because of his own unruly passions. He wanted to create a religion that would justify his unruly passions, uh, specifically his 
marriage to Katarina von Bora, a nun, and the violation of his vows. So he basically damaged reason significantly. And we have now the rise of what we would call fundamentalism. Sola scriptura was Luther's term. And a more of a literal hermeneutic. No. Yeah. So the big question, for if you were Martin Luther sitting here today, I'd say, okay, you believe in sola scriptura, scripture alone, <coughs> nothing else, scripture alone should be our guide. <coughs> Where can you find the term sola scriptura in scripture? Well, it's not there. It was created by Martin Luther to justify his attempt to reorganize the, the Catholic faith along different lines. This wound created what we now call fundamentalism, uh, and so what you had here is a, 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 a destruction of the Catholic unity of Europe, where the unity was based that faith is compatible with reason in the way I just explained. Now faith is at odds with reason because of what Luther did. And he created division in Europe, and the division led to war between Christian groups, and the war led to scandal, and the scandal led to the rise of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was basically, okay, faith, uh, you can't follow faith. It leads to war. All you can do is follow reason. Well, this is a truncated reason now because we're beginning to see this is the separation of church and state kind of reason that we have grown up under and we have internalized. And that's the problem. That leads to the, the problem of the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment then leads to a complete repudiation of reason. That's the problem when you disconnect it from its sources. It can't sustain itself. And so just as reason disconnected from any greater source at the time of the Greeks led to magic, so reason disconnected from the church led to Michel Foucault and the justification of homosexuality and this, the wretched world that we live in today, which is basically the ninth circle of hell, the great Satan presiding over sodomites and usurers. And our subjugation to these people. I'm talking about we, the people of Indiana, the people who rebelled against the oligarchic rule by voting for Donald Trump, only now to have Donald Trump betray everything that we voted for him. But that's another story here. So you see the problem here. You've got, and so we're back, we're now in a room that is much bigger than we've ever had before. As you said, before you were, you're in cable access. If you're lucky, two people might walk up to you in a supermarket and say, hey man, I saw your show. Well, awesome. a, lot, a lot of people would watch it, but they weren't, they weren't uh, it wasn't something you would comment. You, when you saw TV, you didn't comment. You never right. like rode into the hillbill, you know, yeah, remember because the hillbillies and said, I liked your show. Yeah, because that was the nature of television, which was a form of control. Basically, just pro it just projects out and you have no way of responding. That has been replaced by the, the internet, which is interactive. And so now we have, when we do a show, it goes on YouTube and it goes all around the world and people all around the world respond to it. So the problem here is not that we can't talk. I mean, we're talking right now. We have a language. I mean, uh, thanks to uh, British imperialism and American imperialism, English has become the world language. It's an example of what Hegel would call the cunning of reason. It's, imperialism is bad, but God brought some good out of it in that fact that there is a language where people can communicate all over the world. But uh, just because you can, can communicate doesn't mean you have something to say or the people you will be able to make yourself understood. And I think this is the phase we have reached right now. Right, because if you're not, if I, in other words, I'm listening to you talk. But if you contradict yourself, I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah. I mean, I, and I have grounds to. So, so the first reaction is Cardinal, or it's, it, or the reaction to what I said about Cardinal Burke. All these people write in and say, no, no, it's, I don't worship the same God as Muslims. That's terrible to think that. Muslims killed my people. I don't want to worship the same God. Well, you know, there are bad people all, all in the world. Some of them are in, in the Catholic Church. It's the Catholics and Protestants killed each other for decades. 30 years, it's 30 years war in Germany, and that led to the Enlightenment, the scandal that that created. So no, that's, that's not really a good argument, but the argument is out in the open, and now we're starting to see the Muslim response to what I'm saying. What am I saying? I'm saying that we need a higher level of uh, 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 discourse here. It's not, I'm not the first guy to say this, okay? This is, in a sense, what 
John, you mentioned Peter Zabratsky. That's what he said. What's it say right there? Yeah, this because uh, you know he, he wrote the the whole thing here, and it's a little bit it's a little bit long to digest the whole thing. Yeah, but well we, enough. But then uh, you can obviously with the internet, and there was he a week later after John Paul II uh, wrote Fides Eratio, he uh, wrote a summary to the to the bishops, and he says. Um, I, I could have read the whole thing, but it's short, but let's just say some of the things he said. The violent history of this century is due in no small part to the closure of reason to the existence of ultimate and objective truth. I wish to defend the capacity of human reason to know the truth. If reason cannot attain ultimate truths, faith loses its reasonable and intelligible character and is reduced to the realm of the non-definable, the sentimental, and the irrational. The outcome is fideism. Okay. Can you explain that? Yeah. Well, basically, uh, let's let's just take the first part. The, okay. The, the re reason can attain some type of ultimate truth. That's true theoretically. But given the state of philosophy as it exists today, it's impossible because because it, it's been redirected. It's been redirected to the abyss. First of all, it's it got it's been it's been going the wrong way for five hundred years now. I mean, Luther was not a philosopher, but what he said had philo philosophical implications. You can go from there to to uh, Hume's skepticism, which became Hume and Adam Smith became the Scottish Enlightenment, became the backbone of the intellectual backbone of the Amer of the uh, the British Empire, and it's skepticism. We can't know any higher truth, so therefore we'll just uh, sell things, and it'll be the language of commerce. America took that over, and it got even worse. Got worse. Nietzsche is the the, the true son of Luther. Nietzsche's father was a Lutheran pastor. He said basically all it is is will. And so you had the culmination of this with someone like Michel Foucault, who channeled Nietzsche into a kind of homosexual terminal phase. And that is the orthodoxy now, not only in American universities, it's universities all over the world. I just got back from Argentina. I mentioned Foucault. There's a lady who says, yeah, that's all they talk about in educational circles. I go to the next issue of Culture Wars, which is going to deal with what we're dealing with today, it has an article by my friend Ravi from India. There is campus unrest in Delhi. There are two campuses. The North Delhi University is, is controlled by Hindu fundamentalists. The South Nehru University is controlled by Marxist, leftist, Foucauldians. And guess what? They can't talk to each other. It is impossible for these two groups of people to talk, talk to each other. There's no common ground whatsoever. Okay? And so what happens when you can't talk to each other? You fight. You get into a fight, and that's precisely what happened. So blood was shed in conflict on these campuses. Well, that's India in a nutshell. You got groups of people who cannot talk to each other. Well, right in the building we're in, they have a little bar over there, and I was talking to one of the fellows that runs his professor, and uh, they had some professors from IUSB, and I said, well, "What were you guys?" He said, "Well, they were all talking about how nobody can talk in their classrooms." Right. They're trying to figure out how can we get the kids to talk to each other because they were divided over, I think, the election. Yeah, yeah. So what, you, what you're seeing now is what did America do yesterday? It dropped the biggest non-nuclear bomb in existence on the Taliban, uh, which is an indication of many things, but uh, one indication is these people cannot talk to each other. First of all, the statements that are made by American leaders political leaders, are so out of contact with reality that nobody in the world believes them. Well, look at 40, 47 editorials in the major papers. 46 of the editorials dealing with uh, Syria, the attack, uh, backed Trump, justified, said Assad did the chemical because attack. Because they're all paid to do this. This is what they're paid to do. It made no sense. First of all, Trump's attack on Syria made no sense whatsoever. He didn't gain one single thing from this other than antagonizing the Russians, who now have removed all the safeguards that were preventing nuclear war. So we're closer to the nuclear war. What did he achieve? Did he stop anything? First of all, 35 of those missiles didn't even hit their target. Right, for some reason Russia or other. had uh, technology. Who knows what, ha what happened there, okay? And the ones that did uh, uh, hit, the, hit an air base that was operational within 24 hours. So he didn't achieve anything other than antagonize the entire world by his arrogance, including, I would have to say, his own voter base. Oh. I did not vote 
for Donald Trump to expand the war in Syria. I voted, I could have voted for Hillary Clinton to do that. And now it seems that he's lost control of his own administration and he's being absorbed into the oligarchy and becoming the loyal servant of oligarchic interests. But, but back to the bigger issue here, they can't talk to each other. The, the, the position that the United States represents is completely incoherent and incomprehensible to the rest of the world. And that is one of the reasons, the main reason, that they have to use force because they're not persuasive anymore. There was a time, I'm not trying to glorify this time, but there was a time when people actually believed what Americans said and believed they had a better system than communism, let's say. Those days are gone. Those days are gone. Nobody believes this anymore. America is the great Satan. <laughs> Who doesn't believe that anymore? Be only the people in Washington and the only people they can talk to are each other. They can't, so um, we're back again to Cardinal Burke and the little room. If there's a real, if there's ever a small room, it's America, uh, American foreign policy. It, 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 it's maybe it's the Congress, maybe it's the White House, but it's really a small room because what they say does not play any place else in the world. Nobody believes it anymore. Well, America has violated the law of non-contradiction. Has not followed the logos in so many areas. So many ways that they they have become a pariah nation, right? With their the, the leader, the other gangster in this group, Israel, a, a, a pariah nation if there ever was one. And now America is following Israel down the path to uh, be the second great pariah nation of the world because they're not making any sense. This does not make sense. There's no logos in this foreign policy anymore. It's nothing but pure will to power. And the whole world knows it, and that's why we have to uh, propose some type of alternative. So, again, as I said, Cardinal Burke's room's too small, okay? And now we've gotten the reaction from the other side, namely the Muslims, okay? Actually, they can actually take a position on what I'm saying here. They are human beings just like us. They have rationality. And so here we have the Muslim position, and guess what? Unfortunately, it's another small room. You're talking about uh, Blake... Um yeah, this is uh, Blake man, Archer a man, Williams. Blake Archer, Archer Williams, which is not his real name. Uh, I met him in um, Tehran four years ago, and we were walking around uh, North Tehran, right is where it becomes mountainous, uh, walking through the Shah's palace. And I happened to mention the, the classic anecdote about the, the Library of Alexandria. When the Muslim ruler arrives in Alexandria, he hears there's this library and he says, uh, what's in the library? And there's this debate. And then he finally comes to the conclusion. If uh, what is in the library is uh, included in the Koran, then it is superfluous and therefore we should burn it. If what is in the library contradicts what is in the Koran, it is heretical and therefore we should burn it. So therefore the conclusion is burn down the library of Alexandria. This, and now Arash got, uh, Abu Tarad got really mad when I said that, uh, okay? And we had this long discussion and basically been having this ongoing discussion ever since. It was he who took me down to Qom, introduced me to the mullahs, tried to have a discussion there, didn't get very far. And it's, uh, you know, I sent him basically the article that we were talking about before, my proposal. What is my proposal to the Iranians? Let's do philosophy completely consistent with what Pope John Paul II said, it's what we need to do right now because these people can't talk to him. Well, the response is, no, we don't need philosophy. And your response to it is, in other words, you're saying, in a sense, you're saying, let us sit down and reason together. Let's talk. Yeah. Well, we, we don't need to talk. <laughs> we don't, no. Well, you don't, we don't need to talk? No. That is his response, and the sum, summary of his response is basically... Philosophy is a maze. We don't need to get lost in this maze. Okay, so in many ways, it's like the classic, what the classic Muslim response. In a way, this is no different than the response that Islam has made throughout its entire history. See, I don't know why you can't use this classic term to say, you know, let's think this through. I mean, aren't those, those are terms that's what, that we're we, trying, that's what I'm proposing. I'm proposing that, you know, we've got the language, we can talk to each other, and I'm now I'm proposing let's just take it a little bit, uh, a little bit higher and come to some type of uh, agreement because Logos is not just 
It's not just philosophy. It's not just language. It's language, a whole continuum that begins with language. It goes all the way up to metaphysics, which is the ability of the mind to reason about uh, divine things. Now, now if you're going to sit down, because it says in Isaiah, let us sit down and reason together. That's the Lord with his people. But, but you had to first, before you could sit down with the Lord and reason together, you had to confess your sins and the sins of your fathers. You had to clear up all these violations of the law of non-contradiction. Well, I mean, I'm trying to. I tried to do that in the article last month, Apocalypse Deferred. I tried to give some type of history of the, the, the you know, history of Logos in Christendom, history of Logos in Islam. Christendom, uh, Christianity was a despised sect in the Roman Empire. And the good side of that was that they didn't have any political responsibility for over 300 years. Well, that's good because they sat down and they taught, hammered things out. You know, they had one ecumenical council after another. The, the, the place was riddled with heresy. There were people that said, no, Jesus Christ is only a man. And there were people who said, Jesus Christ is only God. And they finally hammered it out and said he was true God and true man. Took, took a long time to work that out. But the, the good news is they had a background in philosophy because they were using Greek. And secondly, they had the leisure or the time to, 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 to hammer these things out. Well, this was never the case with Islam. Islam was swept through northern Africa by the sword. It was written in Arabic, which is not a philosophical language. And there was strife immediately. The, the son-in-law, Ali, son uh, um, the prophet's son-in-law, was murdered. And this created a split that began from the beginning, the Shia, the split between the Shia and the Sunnis, which persists to the day. And the people I'm talking to are the Shias or, or the Persians. So you're, what you're saying is, now is a chance, uh, in this time in history, if you're talking to the Middle East people, uh, now is a time where you, we can, you might have time now to actually think this through. Well, we have to. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's not that we have time. We are forced by the movement of history to a point where we have to deal with this now. I mean, for, for a thousand years, let's say uh, they, they tried, they failed. Ibn Rushd could not reconcile Aristotle and the Koran. And so the, the will people took over and said, basically, Allah is pure will. He doesn't have to make sense. You just submit to what he says no matter what. Well, this is not God. This is not an understanding of God. If there's logos in the universe that is the creation of God, there has to be even more logos in God himself, right? So you can't say there's no Logos in God. You're, that's, that's outrageous and irrational. And, but that's what they did because God became an exalted caliph. And the caliph was the political leader who simply imposed this solution on the Muslims and said, this is it. I said it. That settles it. There are nine Korans and that's it. No more, no less. They contradict each other, but I said it. That's it. It's over. Now, I, now my friend would tell me that this had a devastating effect on the development of Islam, okay? But now it seems to me he's reverting to this position of basically, uh, we have the Koran, we don't need anything else. Well, wait a minute, what do you mean? And then the, the, the irony is here, he starts talking about my position, and then he says at some point, Jones contradicts himself. Wow. Well, I, I, first of all, I don't think I contradicted myself, but se let's assume that I did. That's good that you pointed out the fact that I contradicted myself. But let me ask you a question. Where can you find the principle of non-contradiction in the Koran? How did you come to this idea that contradiction was bad? You could not have come to it by via sola scriptura, by scripture alone. It's not there. So what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that philosophy has an autonomy all of its own, that this is a manifestation of God's power, but we're talking about God. Um, obviously, there are three persons in God, although they disagree. There are three persons, and you can't divide them up, but we're talking something about creation, God the Father. This is the revelation of God the Father, if you want to talk about it in theological terms which is basically that he created a world that has a rationality to it. And the human mind can explicate that rationality all in, in, on its own. It has its own autonomy. And the principle of non-contradiction is one of those things that the human mind discovered all by itself. And you have to follow this. It's not in scripture. It's not one of the Ten Commandments that Moses got. But you have to follow it which means that reason is part of what you have to follow in this world. And that's what I'm proposing here. 
uh, could you say that we've, we're no longer uh, upholding the law of um, non-contradiction in America? So let's say, for example, the feminist movement could just shift from where they're at now and then embrace the Muslim faith. Because well, sure, I've, that has happened. I've, I've, I was like, it's like, how could you do that? Well, <laughs> they're not operating on any local. Actually, I did. I did. That's that is uh, precisely what is probably going to happen in uh, places like England. One, one of the times when I was in Tehran, I met this uh, English journalist who had been covering the story in Afghanistan, had been captured by the Taliban, and during her captivity, she became a Muslim. So we're talking, I, I, we're giving a talk to this group of young people and I start talking about birth control and suddenly she can't control herself anymore and starts yelling at me. <laughs> How dare you talk about this? The, the Iranians are, who are all the, the politest people in the world are all shocked that this lady is attacking me like this. But you see the, the, the incoherence here. You know, she, she's wearing the hijab. She's dressed like a Muslim. You drew out her old, from her past. Yeah, it's, it's, like the, it's like the cat, you know, uh, Aesop's story of the cat. You know, the woman who was really a cat, and then the mouse comes in, and she jumps up and pounces and so on. She can't, because nature will out. And so the nature, the feminist was still there under the hijab, and there's this kind of incoherence that, that I brought out by attacking uh, birth control. But I'm saying that that may very well happen, and it is happening in places like England. Because we're already in violation of logos. Because, because the West has failed. I keep saying this over and over again. That's what Denethor said. Why has the West failed? Because they've turned away from Logos. Well, in my mind, <clears throat> 1776, Wesley and Fletcher, they observed what America was doing. They wrote books on it in 1776. And they said, hold it here. What you, the principles you guys are following, claiming to be Christians, you're going to have to throw away the scriptures if you're going to pursue on the path you're on. And then you had the issue on slavery, where John Henry Hopkins said, of all the doctrines in the church, this was the least questioned on slavery, okay? Now, that's, now people are up in the arms, but Dulles took on Noonan on that. So we violated it there. We're, we're violating Christian principles and in buying into the American empire, and we don't even recognize it. And so we're so, we're so trapped. Well, what happened is the North could not talk to the South. And one of the... Cru yeah, they resorted, the, yeah. The, the, crucial, the crucial moment came with John Brown, who was a terrorist... Uh, a, his terrorist attack on Harper's Ferry, and then the fact that uh, the, 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 the inaction on the part of the North in dealing with this convinced that the South, that uh, they had to get ready for war. So I'm, I'm saying, again, the principle is always the same. If you, if you can't talk, uh, talk it over, you're going to end up uh, with some type of war. But now you got Tillerson going over trying to talk with Putin. How is he going to talk to him? <laughs> How is it possible? Because Americans can't talk to anybody. They can't talk to anybody. The mouth is moving and the words are coming out, but nothing, it doesn't make any sense. There is no possible way you can, you can justify the policies that are now being pursued in the Middle East. And, to, and so Trump, the guy that we voted for because he was going to make peace with Russia has now created a situation where we're closer to war with Russia than we were under Obama. If you remember, Obama did not fall for the false flag gas attack in 2013. You no, said that was his greatest achievement. They asked him, what was what's the greatest moment you had? Not give, Somebody told me this, not giving in. Yeah. To bombing Syria. He was smart enough to realize there's something else afoot here. And of course... He's a pawn of the deep state as well. And so what did the deep state do to get around the fact that peace was threatening to break out? If, uh, if he collaborates with the Russians on the disposal of chemical weapons, well, the deep state, under the leadership of that Jewish lady, Victoria Nuland, created the coup d'etat in Ukraine to open up another front to ensure that we will have a war with Russia. The deep state is deeply committed to a war with Russia the American electorate voted against this, and now Trump, within 77 days, has now done a complete U-turn, and now we're back. We're worse off than we were under Obama. Well, what, what's the worst diplomatic move ever made in the whole 20th century that we're that we're supposed to believe in? Wasn't it Chamberlain's, the Munich Pact, that he, you know, unbelievably went for this false peace when he should have known? I mean. <laughs> I mean, what's your opinion on that? 
my opinion on that is completely irrelevant to the, what we're talking okay. about right now. Okay. <laughs> because what happened here is that Trump should have been able to see through this, did not. Apparently, he felt that uh, he didn't have, I don't know what, I don't know what's going on in that guy's mind. Who knows? I just know that we're now in a, in a very dangerous situation, much more dangerous than before. Because what? Because we can't talk. Because the, Amer the, the, the Russians now believe that it is a waste of time to talk to uh, Americans. No, uh, because they violate every single agreement that you make with them. They, they lie to you and so on and so forth. Uh, in the bishops uh, thing here, he says the, it's, the goal, it's the goal of the bishops to uh, encourage, not just at universities... Intel philosophical and intellectual discussions. Let's, let's make it clear. The universities are a disaster. The universities are centers of anti-logos. The Catholic universities have completely gone over to the dark side. They are, they, are, they are devotees of Michel Foucault and Nietzsche and every other apostle of anti-logos. It says here, you, you, talking to the bishops, you must do all you can to raise the level of philosophical and theological reflection, not only in seminaries and Catholic institutions, but also among Catholic intellectuals and all those who seek a deeper understanding of reality. I mean, the truth is that Notre Dame, when I was there, and it's been the testimony for the longest time, that very seldom do the students engage. All right, so what, so we, what is this, the time we're in? This is 50 years after Father Hesburgh stole Notre Dame from the Catholic Church. The Land of Lake State... 67. 1967. We are coming up now. This summer will be the 50th anniversary of that alienation of church property. And what has, what has, what has it produced? It has produced a, 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 law, a bunch of lackeys to the great Satan. Okay, promoters of sodomy and usury. Yeah, we're one of the few towns in, in Indiana that has a gay mayor. Promoters of sodomy. This is the ninth circle of hell. That's the new world order that the United States is proposing. And the rest of the world doesn't like it. I don't know what's wrong with the rest of the world. Why don't they like sodomy and usury? What's wrong with them? Somehow they think it's wrong. I don't know. I don't know. Why, 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 what's wrong with these people? We need to drop more bombs on them, I guess. What's the problem here? The problem here is that we are, what is coming out of our mouth is totally incoherent. Well, it, it, it makes no sense. And so as a result, we are being, we are, we are becoming, the, the, the group of people who run policy are becoming this small beleaguered circle whose only response to anything in the world is to drop a bomb on it. We can't talk to anybody anymore. Well, it, it says the, the love of money is the root of all evil. So if the evil we're addressing here is, is the refusal to engage in, in, in intellectual, reasonable uh, dialogue. And see, so, so, what, so what do we have here? We have a prince of the church who makes a statement that uh, we're, there are two gods out there, and there's a Muslim god, and, and, and they don't worship the same god. And then the Muslim response is, we don't need philosophy. We have the Koran. The Koran is perfect. The Koran speaks on its own. The Koran, sola scriptura, the Koran. And half the time, my friend here talks as if he's Martin Luther. Half the time, he sounds like Jacques Derrida. Half the time, he sounds like Emmanuel Kant. I don't know. I don't know. how. We can't talk to each other. That's why I'm saying what I'm proposing is necessary. We need a way to talk to each other on a higher level than simply how much does that cost? Right. It's all about... Uh... <laughs> my friend it because that's the commercial republic that the, the United States was created to be and now it's reached the end of its rope okay because now we're going if you don't buy if you don't buy do what we say we're going to drop a bomb on you that is not <laughs> that's no way to that's that's just not that's not going to fly most most of America I mean I think somebody was t trying to persuade me most most American transactions are based on money of some kind yeah I understand that which I is, understand that. Which is not the ideal. So we can't rely on, even though we have the language, we cannot rely on the language to, it be, to reach any type of agreement on higher things. We can haggle over a price, you know, and I guess that works. It'll work for a while, even though that's, that's starting to fail too. So everything will fail. We have to return to metaphysical principles because metaphysical principles are mandatory. 
And they're mandatory because they are based on reason and we have a duty to be rational creatures. Now, I don't care where I am in the world. I hope this YouTube video goes all over the world because I'd like to some hear someone contradict what I just said. How can you contradict what I just said? Are we rational creatures? Are you going to say no? How did you say no? You used language to say no, we're not rational creatures? That's, you contradicted yourself. Well, Jesus talk, talked about contradiction. And, and the only one that I see, he says, you can't serve two masters. You either love one or hate the other, cling to one or despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. So he says, that, that's implying a law of contradiction. You can't, right. you can't be doing both. So if you're, the pre, if you're our president, if you got elected instead of Trump, and you're trying to steer the country well, you're going to have to deal with that. I mean, if the whole country is at the service of man. Well, I mean, to, to, give, to give Trump credit, I mean, the, the, the deep state declared war on him after he, after he uh, was elected. So I understand that uh, the pressures that are being put on him, but the problem is that they coerced him into betraying his own base. That's the problem. That this is what they always try to do. This is what they tried to do with, with Obama. Remember Obama first got in. First thing he does when he gets in is attack Reverend uh, Wright. You know, his buddy. Yeah, his buddy, his mentor. This shows you that he is, this showed the oligarchs that uh, Obama was willing to throw anybody under the bus if the oligarchs told him to do so. Well, Trump's good buddy was Russia, supposedly, and he threw him under the bus. Well, I mean, no, that, I mean, let's get closer to home. Trump's buddy was Steve Bannon. And you had at the heart of this campaign, you had two forces, uh, two of the forces of the three forces that make uh, that constitute civil life in America. I'm talking about the triple melting pot, Protestant, Catholic, and Jew. The same conflict that led to the, the, the Legion of Decency back then, Catholics versus Jews. Well, it turns out it's Catholic versus Jews in the Trump administration, too. Steve Bannon, who's trying to channel America first in some way or other, the Catholic. And then there's Jared Kushner, who is an agent of the Israel lobby. And Kushner won. And Bannon has been banished. And so there wins again. The Catholics lose out. They vote for the guy. And then as soon as the guy gets in an office, he's got to do the bidding of the Jews uh, because they got the money. Or uh, if they don't have the money, he's got to do the bidding of the oligarchs because they are going to control the narrative. Well, I guess, what, what did it last? 77 days before he capitulated? And now what it is. The other, the other angle of this is, of course, China. He needs China to rein in um, Korea. Okay. So what does he do? He has China is no longer manipulating currency and Chinese goods are OK. Well, the, the Chinese goods flooding into this country are what destroyed the American workforce. OK, so once again, we've been sold out, sold out again in the interest of what? In the interest of neoconservative Israel first foreign policy, once again, because the American empire and its 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 desire to conquer the world trumps every other card in the deck. That's what we voted against. That's what's been reinstated. Can, can people say, you know, because the neoconservatives are basically who, who he's following, can they say people that followed Leon Trotsky? I mean, how do you, how do you, under, how do you get at where the neoconservatives are, who they really are? And, and By looking at their history and where they came from. So they were Trotskyites. Irving Kristol was a Trotskyite at City Community College in New York City. He was at the Trotskyite alcove. Uh, the same Jewish revolutionary spirit that animated the Trotskyites animates the neoconservatives. It's just a different, it's a different country. It's not the Soviet Union. It's the United States as the avant-garde of revolutionary activity throughout the world. They're still promoting the same thing. It's still the same anti, the same Jewish anti-logos that leads to perpetual war. That was Trotsky's slogan, wasn't it? Perpetual war. That's what we're talking about here. Serving the interests. The American people do not want perpetual war. They voted against perpetual war. And once again, the American people have been betrayed by the same group of people. Same group of people. And if you can't talk about who it is, you're never going to deal with it properly. You would think that the people our age, the, the baby boomers, who grew up with a lot of dialogue in their teenage years, you know, there was a lot of discussion. And what happened to the baby boomers? Well, they fell into 
violating the principle of logos. I mean, they and how did they fall? What was the bait that led them into that trap? Was well, first sexual of all, it was sexual revolution? Sexual revolution. Part. Let's be honest because here. you can't. It was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and it wrecked my generation, our generation, wrecked them. Well, if you if you wrecked them, if you violated a girl when you're a teenager, and then you're going to have a, a high school reunion, you're not going to be all proud about. And what was the culmination of this? The culmination of this was Michel Foucault's Pact with the Devil in Death Valley in 1975, where he takes LSD and he suddenly has this vision of how to solve this problem. This is the revolutionary movement in Europe led to uh, the revolution in France in 68 in Paris. The revolutionary movement is still going strong. It descended into terrorism in Germany with the Bader Meinhof gang. This is, I was over in Germany watching this, had a front row seat, and Michel Foucault suddenly has this epiphany. He calls it his pact with the devil. What's his pact with the devil? Basically, he comes up with a way of making everybody happy, everybody meaning the oligarchs and the left. You give us sexual liberation, we won't criticize your economic system. That's the end of the left. Michel Foucault killed the left. We are living under that, the terms of that agreement to this day. Every single university teaches the terms of that agreement to this day. So we can talk about gay marriage, but we can't talk about decent jobs. And when the oligarchs appoint uh, someone, a, a homosexual, to rule over us, as they did in South Bend with our mayor, Pete Buttigieg, what's his message? This is in the New York Times. The good jobs are not coming back. So go to the gay disco and forget about all your troubles. That's the story of our generation. And that's what we have to wake up from uh, now. Be, uh, uh, in some sense or other to kind of save this because this is a situation that's confronting the entire world because America is the imperial power that aspires to rule the entire world. And so the Islamic world cannot live off in that little room anymore. They could live in the desert by themselves for a thousand years, but that era is over. And now the supreme leader, when he gives his talk, I was at his talk in Tehran, he said, how can we tell true Islam from American Islam, meaning ISIS, Daesh? He said, we have to use reason. And so here you have it. Mm. Here you have it. An opening. There's an opening right there. An opening right there that I am hoping to walk through by the, making this proposal to the Iranians. Let's resurrect philosophy, the true philosophy, the one that Pope John Paul II talked about, the true philosophy of being, of access to being, where the mind can access being, the philosophy of Logos that began with uh, Anaxagoras and Plato and Aristotle. But aren't you coming now in the building we're in, <clears throat> the people that, that are running the building, <clears throat> they're connected to the Middle East. And some of them are missionaries. Uh, grandparents were missionaries. And her position is, yeah, if a Muslim converts, their life is in danger. I mean, if not, converts to I'm Christianity. Not, I'm, not, I'm not asking anyone to convert to Christianity. I'm asking people to talk to each other in a reasonable fashion. I'm talking about the rebirth of philosophy. Now, if you ask me, I can go back to the paradigm. If you t accept, uh, join with me on this journey, if you're one of the magi and you start following the star through the desert, uh, I, I think I know where it's going to lead you. Okay? But that's your decision. That's not my decision. You know? You, you, you have to be docile to the truth. We all have to be docile to the truth. And I'm not going to say, you know, there's no end point to this journey. There is an end point. I think I know what it is. But the point is that we have to engage in this journey. That's all I'm talking about. Here. And they have to have the courage to do it. They, it needs courage. I don't care where you are. Whether, it needs courage in South Bend, Indiana. I'm sure it needs courage in Mosul or wherever it is. Uh, uh, but I don't see any alternative. And I think the Supreme Leader is, and I are talking. Let, let's, the Supreme Leader, I hate to... I'm, I'm putting myself in such august company here, but the Supreme Leader and Pope John Paul II and I are all talking about the same thing, I think. And my hunch is that if we could talk further, we could come up to some type of agreement that would lead to a better world.
Because ultimately, what am I saying here? Ultimately, in the mind of God, you know, there is no contradiction here. There's no contradiction between faith and reason in the mind of God. There is one God, Pache Cardinal Burke. There is one God, and his mind, this God is Logos. We can say that both from reason and faith. St. John said it, Logos and Theos. Logos is God. And if Logos is, is reasoning and dialoguing in the Trinity, they're, they're, they're perfect There's love, dialogue perfect there. di- di- There's intense dialogue there. dialogue. So if, 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 this, if God is Logos, then we have a duty to follow this. And that's all I'm saying. This, this, we can make use of uh, the, the philosoph- philosophies that have articulated this in the past, and we can forge some way of talking that will transcend all the barriers these little rooms that we've been in for, but your duty to logos, your duty, it's your duty that uh, compelled you to go to Iran because you have a duty to follow logos, which is to share, which is to communicate. We all have a duty. This is mandatory, and why is it mandatory? I'm talking about every aspect of it, including practical reason, uh, which is another word for morality. We have a duty to do this. Because we are creatures of Logos, and if we violate that, we are violating our very nature and our very being. Well, St. Paul said, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. In other words, the gospel is Christ. So, woe to me if I don't share Logos. And how do you share Logos? By being Logos, right? By, by you share the truth by... By subordinating yourself to the truth, yeah. first of all. And I'm saying this is mandatory. I don't care where you are on this planet. You're a rational creature. And because you're a rational creature, certain rules follow. And the main reason that people don't want to be rational is because they know that those rules follow and they want to be exempt from the rules. And well, that, that, that leads that, us back to that. That was a good point that uh, uh, William, um, Blake Archer Williams, that you friend in Iran. Because I did like what he said here, right? As he opens up his article, philosophy will get us nowhere. Of course, he's... <laughs> One of the ways which the moderns use to get out from under the burden of living in accordance with God's will, and thus being true to the trust with which we have been entrusted, is to say that he does not exist. You know, half of Britain, half of Norway, I mean, I don't know all of every country, sure. but don't even say, I don't even believe in God. Well, obviously... That's irrational. It's irrational, but you understand why. They just want, they, they don't want to deal with it. Right. Who can, you know, who, I don't have to worry about this God relationship. I can sleep with anybody I want. Now, because there is no God. It's, it's that, that's the rationale. In Amer- American empire, its notions of freedom kind of kind of enables them to do that. Ac- absolutely. So sexual liberation is a form of control. Well, this will be the end of the show for Israel. And as Mike said, uh, using your freedom, not for the flesh, but use your freedom to be like the wise men. They followed the star. They used their freedom to seek after the highest thing. And as they sought after the highest thing, they followed the star, they ended up in Bethlehem, and they inquired. Uh, the scripture says that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. They got wisdom there. And then God told them in a dream to uh, get out of there. But if you follow uh, the wisdom that's given you, you may come to the knowledge of Christ. You may discover that Jesus is who the scripture says he is and this show is called Israel and the New Testament indicates very strongly that Jesus is the true Israel and that's why I called the show Israel could remind us you know to think about who Israel is and who Jesus is so until the next time this is Peter Helland with Dr. E. Michael Jones Oh, no.